If you weren't here on Friday, uh, you know that I am uh, Professor Thomas Bradbury, and I am guest lecturing for Dr. Carney, your uh, regular professor. Uh, Dr. Carney and his wife gave birth to a lovely baby boy on uh, Friday night, 1057. His name is Gabriel Andrew Schulman Carney. And uh, moments ago, I saw a picture of him. And just like every other baby you've seen, he looks like an old man. But he's an adorable old man, and I'm sure Ben will be telling you stories in uh, two weeks. Uh, Professor Carney will be telling you stories about uh, uh, Gabriel Andrew in uh, no time whatsoever. Well, today it is my pleasure once again to have the opportunity to uh, come to your class and uh, talk with you about close relationships. And um, just to give you a little bit of a back background, I'd like to go back uh, a few steps before I launch ahead in uh, today's class, which will be about sex and gender and sexual orientation. You know, this class is, in this class, we invite you to consider a couple. Think about a couple, two people who are coordinating their behaviors in relation to one another, having uh, exchanges that are more than superficial, that are meaningful, that uh, involve uh, development and change over time. And we ask you to consider that couple from lots of different per perspectives, to think about what are the forces that operate on that couple, within that couple, uh, that help, to help us to understand that couple and help us in particular to understand how it changes, how it might be fulfilling, how it might be frustrating, uh, why it's a good relationship, why it might not be so good a relationship, and why it may or may not uh, enable the participants within that relationship to reap some of the be benefits that we know exist uh, within social bonds. So consider a couple. That's what we ask you to do. Consider a couple. Think about a couple. And so far, we've given you some tools uh, to think about how to do that. We have this analytic task of trying to make sense of human intimacy, this uh, wonderfully amorphous, complex uh, set of phenomena. And so you now have two sets of tools, one being methodological in nature, so you can understand the research that gets conducted. It's important for you to know that this is an empirical discipline, and we try to do as good research as we possibly can so that we can understand intimacy and give people leverage for having better relationships of their own. Uh, so that was one set of tools, methodological tools, that Professor Carney went over. Uh, a second set of methodological tools is uh, uh, intellectual devices, the ways of thinking and explaining and getting some starting points in our heads, some ideas in our heads for thinking about uh, what kinds of questions you might ask, what kinds of data you might collect, and then that would lead you to think about what specific kinds of research designs that you might employ to uh, collect those data and answer those questions. So you have methodological tools as well as intellectual conceptual tools that help you to organize expl explanations, think about what kind of data you most want to collect. So that's where we are. And today we uh, move in a very new and important direction in this class because now we start to get really into the substance of intimacy itself, the, 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 the material itself, not just how to think about it, how to analyze it, what is it, but what are the experiences that happen within relationships? And as we start that uh, down this road, we have to ask um, one very simple question, which is, uh, what do we learn when, when you think about any relationship, when you think about any couple, when you consider a couple? Um, by the way, that hum is really annoying and will drive me nuts. Um, what, uh, there are two, two things that exist within every relationship. One of them is uh, that the participants themselves have, have biological sexes. They are either male or female, almost always. And they either prefer, prefer uh, men or women. So when we think about close relationships, we have to think about the biolog biology, the, the plumbing, if you will, of the people involved, as well as the preferences they have for the plumbing of their partner. Hello. How are you today? Good. We're talking about sex and gender today. Yeah. If you have anything to add to that, just jump right in. So uh, I want to get started with some terminology. Uh, terminology, here's a cartoon of uh, two women talking in a coffee shop kind of thing. And uh, they're saying, uh, the woman on the left says, sex brought us together, but gender drove us apart. 
okay? When I talk about sex today, that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about biological sex, okay? Uh, not the act of sexual intimacy. We'll spend more time talking about that when we talk about pro-social processes, the processes that join people together and keep them together. Uh, and uh, when we talk about gender, we're probably not talking about gender in the way that this couple means it here. We're going to talk about gender as the prescriptions, the expectations, the societal roles and norms that people have for men and women, right? So for a given a person who is biologically either male or female, there are many different, the different societies um, will define what it means to be a man in different ways or what it means to be a woman in different ways. And even within a society, there are many different ways of being masculine, for example, or many different ways of being feminine if you're a man or a woman. So when we think about bio uh, sex, we're thinking about biology. When we think about gender, we're thinking about uh, variability within the role that uh, you could have if you're a man or a woman, okay? So gender is more of a social prescription whereas uh, sex is really a biological uh, given. And we'll talk about sex, gender, as well as orientation. That is to say, whether your preference is more for uh, someone of your own gender or someone of uh, the other gender. OK. So let's start with the uh, sex and gender part. And then at the end of, uh, the, toward the end of the class, I'll talk more about um, uh, orientation. Well, uh, here's, a, here's a cover of a magazine uh, called American Health. It's from uh, a while back, 1990. Uh, but it depicts something that I believe is true in our society, which is that we believe there is a battle of the sexes. We believe that ma many people in our society believe that um, relationships are doomed to fail because uh, what heterosexual relationships are often doomed to fail because men and women, as this, uh, this image so clearly uh, depicts, men and women usually are in a battle of some kind, right? And that's why relationships are hard. Now, logically, this cannot be true because there are many relationships in which, uh, involving men and women in which they're very happy. So it cannot be fundamentally a problem of men and women being together in a relationship that causes the deterioration or the demise of relationships. That logically can't be true. And yet we still have to come to terms with the fact that uh, in heterosexual relationships at least there is a man and a woman and that we want to try to understand the, uh, the ways in which men and women might be different. Okay? Now even if they're not in a heterosexual relationship, we still want to understand how men and women differ. Okay? So what I want to do is take you through some relatively accurate, I believe, stereotypical notions of how men perceive women and how women perceive men. Uh, then I want to give you a way of thinking about gender differences in general, gender differences in social behavior. And uh, I want to use a clip from uh, Knocked Up, the video Knocked Up. By the way, are you all above the age of 18? No, some of you are not. You may want to step out uh, during Knocked Up. This is a, I, I have the uncensored version, by the way. Uh, there is some language in here that's a little coarse. Uh, it's uh, not for civil discourse, but I insist on it in my movies, in fact. So uh, we will watch a little clip, and if you've seen that movie, you might be thinking, how could anything in that movie have anything useful to say about gender in intimate relationships. It turns out to be profoundly relevant to what we're going to talk about today. So, how do men and women differ? Well, this is from a survey that I found online. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, men and women alike, probably most of them heterosexual, uh, wrote in and uh, were commenting on uh, how men and women are different and why can't my partner, here's how I would love for my partner to be different. So I read 300 responses from women, 300 responses from men, and here's what I distilled. These are the things that come up over and over and over again. Uh, so, here's what men say. She really doesn't want to have sex all that much, not nearly as much as me. This is a problem in our relationship. And women say in response, well, foreplay is all day. We don't just have sex, it's part of the bond that we form within our relationship. You have to love me and adore me. Sex follows from that, okay? Very common in all of this material, maybe even in your own relationships. She always wants to talk. She's just 
constantly talking, 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 talking. Why does she talk so much? I'm trying to watch the game after all. She's always talking. Well, that's how women connect. Women respond and they say, yeah, go see the first answer. We need to talk. That's how we connect. That's how we share information and relationships. This is what matters to me, right? She can be very critical of me. Men say this a lot. She can be very critical of me. I really feel criticized. What I really want is less nagging, more shagging. That's what I want. <laughs> why, do, why is that so hard for her to understand? Okay. Well, I, we don't mean to be critical. This is what women say in response. It's not our intent to be critical, but maybe your ego is just a bit too fragile, and maybe we criticize you because we're not so secure in how you feel about us. If you would just tell us a little bit more about your feelings and how you feel about us, we'd feel a little more secure, we wouldn't be so nitpicky, and then uh, our relationship would be better, and maybe even you'll get lucky in the sack. Okay, that's what men say. Uh, here's, a, here's the male prostitute. Uh, a man is leaning into the car, <laughs> and he says, oh yeah, baby, I'll listen to you. I'll listen to you all night long. Right? This is, this is a stereotype. These are all stereotypes, but this is a stereotype of what a woman wants in a man. This is the male prostitute. I would pay money. If I were a woman, I would pay money for someone to just listen to me and snuggle and be close with. Okay. Well, let's flip this around a little bit. Uh, what do women say? Well, women say he's not so romantic. He's just not, you know, he's... He just doesn't have that, uh, you know, he's, he's not really thinking about me all the time. Um, and men say, yeah, we're not so good about that. That is, that is not a strength. We need some reminders. But your nagging and criticism really kind of make us want to withdraw. We disengage when we feel like you're criticizing us, and it's hard to really feel like we want to connect up with you. And you don't always take great care of yourself. By the way, you've put on a few pounds since we got married. Men say that. Uh, and there's biological reasons why men say that, and we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, you sort of don't help around the house enough. Like, my husband doesn't do enough. I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life. I'm taking care of the kids, I'm doing the groceries, I'm taking care of uh, lots of different things. I'm sort of the air traffic controller in this house, and I need some help. And men say, well, help I can do. Don't put me in charge of anything. But what I'd like you to do is to appreciate all that I'm doing outside the house. Okay? I'm doing stuff outside the house to support the house. Right? I, I have a job, and society maybe even puts me in a position to make more money than you. Isn't it smart that I then try to go make more money and bring that home? Isn't that better? Uh, so, respect the contributions we make outside the house and admire me for doing that. Right? That's what I want. I want admiration. And maybe also in the house, you know, I don't, my mother never really taught me how to cook, so if you could help me make spaghetti, I'd really appreciate it. Well, another uh, thing that women sometimes say, uh, he doesn't really share his feelings that much. He's kind of closed off to me. Um, and men, in response to this, say, uh, that's hard for us. Right? We don't, we're not really good at that, and I think there's a, an evolved reason why men are not very good at that. Uh, and it doesn't come naturally for us. And for us, it feels like that's easier after we've had sex than before it, okay? <laughs> Women say, no, we need that before sex rather than after it, right? So therein lies some of the dilemmas that men and women face. Here's, a, uh, here's a, another cartoon. Uh, the woman is saying, I wish you'd open up to me. I need some more ammunition, right? This is, if that's how women perceive the male prostitute, here, I'll give you money if you'll just listen to my feelings and just talk with me for several hours. A man perceives his wife or his partner, female partner, to say, you know, if I open up, if I talk with you, I'm just going to get ripped to shreds, okay? And that's uncomfortable for me. I don't, I, I don't like that. And we need to, as scholars in this room, we need to think not just about the interesting anecdotes, but we need to extract a rule. We need to extract a way of thinking about this so that we can think in a more principled way about how men and women differ, and there is a very good way. Before I get to that, let's talk about what the, oh, uh, I'll talk about the research that helps us to get to that principle, that actually helps us to organize the anecdotes that I just shared with you. 
Uh, if you get a minute to use, uh, as John McCain calls it, the Google, um, <laughs> I suggest that you uh, use the Google to look up uh, psychological differences between the sexes. This is a really funny video from probably 1950, 1952. This is probably what your parents watched in junior high school. Okay? This is uh, like a, a, um, a personal hygiene, a social hygiene film that your parents would have watched during health. And it talks about how is it that men and women are really fundamentally different. And uh, it's uh, really a scream, and I hope you watch it. It'll only take 12 minutes, and uh, you will find it on uh, Google Video. But people have done a lot of studies. The, um, the, fortunately, we don't have to really rely on anecdotes and stories that people tell or just uh, assumptions that people make about how men and women differ. We can collect a lot of information. We can do a lot of uh, studies. We can measure characteristics, dimensions, along which we think men and women are going to differ. And we can compare men and women and see whether or not they really do differ. Right? And the textbook, I think, is pretty clear. The chapter in your textbook is really pretty clear about outlining this. And um, uh, on the left side, uh, this is taken right out of your textbook, I've presented uh, three scenaria that describe what uh, the results of one of these studies. So let's say we measured, let's say we wanted to know whether men are, or women are more uh, empathic. And we had uh, some good procedure for measuring empathy. How we do that is not really of importance to me right now, but let's say we had a, a reliable procedure for uh, assessing empathy. We could ask men and women to participate in this task or fill out this questionnaire or do whatever, whatever, it, is, whatever it is would be, and we can then see um, in the, as in the top panel there, panel A, uh, do the two distributions, uh, these bell-shaped curves of men and women on their scores, these are like a frequency histogram, if you remember that from uh, Psych 100B. These are frequency histograms of all the scores. And in panel A, we have a complete overlap between the men and the women. You see that? So we then put a statistic on that. It's called the D statistic. And you can see it at the very top of that bell-shaped curve. And the D value is zero. There is no difference, no difference whatsoever between those groups. That contrasts with a situation in which um, the males and the females differ slightly. Let's say we did the study and it turns out they differ slightly. Now you can see some separation between those two curves, right? And we would put a D value on that of 0.4. And another, we could do it, we might even find a higher D value, and I've shown a graph where the D value is 0.85. What I want to tell you, and what you know from reading your chapter, is that most D values, most differences between men and women, tend to be very small. They tend to be between the, 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 the B and C panels. There's some examples where there's huge differences. Like, for example, I forget the exact number in the book, but the, the difference between men and women being able to throw a, a softball, well, that's a D value of like 3.4. It's a huge number. Most of the psychological differences between men and women are relatively small. Doesn't mean they're trivial. Because when you collect them, when you aggregate them, they gain some power. Because they're in lots of, lots of small differences can add up to be very significant and create uh, somewhat different sorts of organisms, as is the case with men and women. But on average, on a given dimension, men and women are surprisingly similar. And there is great variability among men and great variability among women. So you might know some women who are really not at all empathic. And you might know some men who are really empathic. And so they sort of run counter to the trend, and they add to, to uh, what we think of as dispersion around the mean, and they reduce the magnitude of that D value. Okay? So we need to understand a couple things here. One is that these effect sizes not huge, and there is dispersion. There are differences among men and women. Question here? Meta-analysis, right. So this would be, we would not just do one study. We would try to aggregate this across as many possible studies as we could get our hands on. So uh, many of the studies that I, uh, that I summarize in the chapter on gender are based on several thousand individuals. So that, that, what that does is it makes the means relatively st uh, stable uh, and representative of uh, what we hope is the general population. 
Okay, so when we use that procedure, this meta-analytic procedure of comparing men and women, we do see differences. Men are more aggressive than women, okay? Uh, that difference decreases when it's provoked anger. When people are provoked, men and women, they get angry, but in general, unprovoked anger, men tend to be a little more aggressive than women. Uh, women tend to seek out support more than men do, in general, okay? These aren't huge differences, but they are reliable differences that show up. Men and women differ in what they prefer from their mates. Men tend to prefer uh, women who are young and attractive and nubile, uh, to being able to produce children. Women, um, uh, women tend to prefer men who have more resources, the idea being that they would be able to use those resources to support any, chi uh, any child that they might bear. Uh, women tend to be more tender-minded, men tend to be more assertive, okay? And finally, the, one of the most uh, uh, robust of all differences is in the area of sexuality. Men, uh, to a uh, very high degree, prefer to have sex, uh, prefer to think about sex, prefer to read about sex, prefer to fantasize about sex, think about sex in every possible way more than, men, more than women think about sex, okay? That is true, and you'll see it outlined pretty clearly, I think, in the, uh, in the reader. But the important message is that the similarities really outweigh the differences. The similarities outweigh the differences. There's much more overlap in these distributions than there is separation, right? There's much more overlap between men and women than there is separation, though it varies depending on the dimension under consideration, and you'll see that all outlined in the, uh, in the reader. So at the same time that these differences across dimensions are relatively small, um, we do know that there are lots of differences across lots of different areas, and they add up, right? They, they come together, they aggregate uh, uh, within a person, within people, and they tend to aggregate within women and within men in different ways. And so what I want to provide for you today is a working understanding of how that breaks down. How can you understand the approach that men and women take in relationships? just as a good working starting hypothesis for thinking about gender and relationships. Well, in order to accomplish that, we have to think about um, what might explain these differences, the differences that we do see. And as you know, we often in this point uh, turn to uh, explanations that focus on uh, biology and nature and evolution. And in fact, one of the theoretical perspectives that you learned about was uh, evolutionary psychology. And this position would say something like this. The observed differences involve women orienting toward others and seeking protection, whereas men provide protection and are more sexually active. Why might this be? Biologically, all of us, men and women alike, are here to send our genes into the next generation. Right? This is what an evolutionary psychologist would say. We are here, we are mere envelopes for sending our genes into the next generation. That's what we're here to do. Men and women, by virtue of the different roles that they p play in the procreation process, uh, that is to say, men having a capacity to impregnate thousands and thousands of women, whereas women are able to have relatively few eggs and hence relatively few children, each of which requires at least nine months of investment. Right? Men and women just have different stakes in the game when it comes to uh, sending their genes into the future. And so women and men play different roles in procreation and caregiving. Right? And what we see, the evolved differences that we see, men being more aggressive, men and women having different preferences for mates, men orienting more, uh, women orienting more toward uh, uh, nurturing, men orienting more toward assertiveness, the argument goes that this would be uh, for evolved reasons. But that's not the entire picture, uh, of course, and in order to really understand these evolved difference, differences, we also have to take into account the environments, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And this part of the argument goes like this. Well, that might be a good starting point for thinking about sex differences, right? It probably is a good starting point, but it overlooks the great capacities that men and women have for fulfilling a variety of social roles, right? It's a pretty rare role in our society that men or women couldn't both participate in and maybe even do equally well given the opportunity, right? So this might be, there might be some settings, some default settings that uh, men and women possess when it comes to orienting toward relationships, but social roles, social restrictions, social opportunities 
uh, really can expand or contract around that basic propensity, right? So for example, there's a study, I believe it's in the reader, that says that, um, well, it turns out that, um, that women do appear to be more sensitive toward babies, toward one-year-old babies. This is Michael Lamb's work. Um, but uh, that might have a lot to do with the fact that women spend a lot more time with babies, right? And if men are given the opportunity to spend time with infants, they really can develop highly sensitive capacities as caregivers. They may not start there. That might not be their default setting in the same way that uh, it is for women, but men can get there. And there are other arenas in which men get a head start, but women can easily catch up, right? So if we modify our ex expectations and our socialization practices, the argument goes that those sex differences would subside, right? That the roles shouldn't be unduly constraining for men or for women, and that we should be uh, given the opportunity to fulfill our potential. For example, men can be as empathic as women, given sufficient incentive, and women can be as domineering as men, given sufficient authority. So, that is to say that there's a certain degree of malleability, a certain degree of movement that people, men and women, can experience around these default settings, and that's why when we look at these distributions, we don't just see a very narrow distribution, all oriented around one, one mean in some very narrow sense. There's a lot of variety, and partly that has to do with how we're socialized and the environments that we find ourselves in. So any understanding of uh, uh, differences between men and women, I believe, have to, have to encompass both of these perspectives. It's uh, uh, one example, I'm not sure if it's in the reader or not, but one example is uh, if you want to think about uh, the music that comes from a violin, you have to think about both the violin itself and the bow going across the strings. You can't have music without both of those things in place. If you want to think about the, uh, the size of a, a table, you have to think about the length and the width simultaneously, but you can't really separate them. You can't pull them apart. They're inextricably bound up in one another. Okay. So, uh, here's, a, uh, here's a cave woman and a cave man looking at, what is that, a mastodon or something. And the, uh, the woman says, you know, you, you go ahead and hunt and I'll gather, right? These are the default settings. It's like, you know, you're much bigger than me. You can throw that spear further and harder than me. Certain roles make more sense than other roles for men and women to inhabit, right? But that doesn't mean that she couldn't do a pretty good job if she had to, or that she couldn't do a pretty good job if it was a smaller animal, or that there are things that he may well be able to do, that she, he might be able to be a very fine gatherer even if all the other cavemen aren't doing the gathering, right? But the idea is that we have default settings, and we've evolved to have default settings, and the default setting for men is, you know, I'm going to go out and hunt. I'm going to orient toward the hierarchy because that's what I do. And women say, I'm not going to orient toward the hierarchy. I'm going to orient toward the dyad. I'm going to think about the horizontal dimension of relationships. You think about the hierarchical dimension. OK. All right, so here's the gist. And this comes from a uh, really wonderful paper by Roy uh, Baumeister and his colleague, um, Christy Summer. Uh, it's published in 1997 in Psychological Bulletin. Uh, he's a social psychologist at Florida State University. And here is what he says. And I believe this is the uh, best operational synopsis that, that we can get our hands on uh, at present. Men and women are equal in the desire for social connection. Right? Men are not uh, wolves, lone wolves. That's not an accurate model. Men like hanging around men, just like women like hanging around women. So that's not the point. But the point is that they meet that need in different ways. Uh, women orient, as I was alluding to earlier, toward the dyadic social interaction. And they want to be appreciated for doing that well. Right? So when, we, when I showed you those earlier vignettes about uh, how men and women complain about one another, uh, women complain because men don't really want to connect and just sit down and chat and just catch up and talk about their feelings and uh, nurture one another, right? Women orient well toward the diet. That's a good part of their de default setting. It doesn't mean that's the only thing they do. It doesn't even mean that men can't do that well, but it means that's where they start. Men start in a totally different place. Men start in a different place. They orient toward group level social interaction. Men think about the hierarchy. 
Men say, where am I in the hierarchy? I'll give you an example of this. Every morning, I wake up and I read the sports page. I have no idea why I read the sports page. Why do I read the sports page? Do I really care if the Lakers won? Not really. But I read the sports page every day. Why is that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Men orient towards hierarchies all the time. Right? Uh, I think this example is still in the reader. Um, who goes to NASCAR races? Well, men, why, who's, men are interested in somebody winning the game. Right? How many people go to the women's NBA games versus the men's NBA games? Right? There's equal number of women in society and men. In fact, there's even slightly higher number of women in our society than men. But the, the Staples Center is not filled with women watching women's basketball. They don't care who wins or loses. They care if they get along, maybe. They care of whether, who they go to the game with. Men just want to go to the game and see who wins. Right? They want to look at the NASCAR races and see who wins. Right? Men orient toward winning and losing in the hierarchy. They want to know how are they doing in the hierarchy. Women, not so much. Women want to orient toward a dyad. They want to have a connection with somebody else. Right? They want to have a connection with a child. They want to have a connection with their family. They want to have a connection with their partner. Is that the only thing they want to do? Absolutely not. I have a friend, in fact I was just speaking with her, she has a fantasy baseball team. How many of you women in this room have fantasy baseball teams? Just shout it out. How many of you men have fantasy baseball teams? Just raise your hand. <laughs> it's quite possible that you men are actually women. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been told that or not. but OK, maybe that was a bad example. But it's possible that women orient toward the dyad, men orient toward the horizon. So how do we see evidence? And men want to be appreciated for this, right? Men want to be appreciated for going out and slaying dragons, right? How was your day today, honey? It was great. Well, tell me about the great things that you did. That's what men want to hear at the end of the day. Women want to talk about their feelings. OK, evidence in intimate relationships. Women think in far more complicated terms about intimacy than men. So if you ask uh, a husband and a wife in the same relationship to talk about a conversation that they just had, or to write down a summary of the conversation that they just had, right? The man will say, we argued. It felt bad. <laughs> the woman will say, well, at the beginning, it seemed like we were agreeing with one another. And then he sort of moved his eyebrow a little bit. And that <laughs> pissed me off, because I've seen other people. I've seen other people do that, and my, my sister's friend does this a lot. And that made me think that maybe he was thinking about the last conversation that we had. And that's not fair, because I was, I was a little upset during that conversation, mostly because of this thing with my boss. Okay? So then, at the beginning, I thought we were agreeing, and then it unfolded. Then we started to disagree. Here's how I think this is all going to go in the future. And men say, ah, we just argued. You know, we just didn't see eye to eye on this. Women have much more differentiated schemes, much more differentiated ways of thinking about intimacy than men do. If you ask uh, men and women to recall what happened on their first dates, women have a lot more information than men. Intimacy and sensitivity and social interaction. Men and women alike all prefer to interact with women. Right? If you say, who would you rather just hang around with like if you needed some emotional support? Men and women don't go to men for emotional support. Men and women go to women for social support, right? Women tend to be the default caregivers in our relationships. So that uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, a parent or a child needs to be taken care of, usually it's the wife that steps up first for that. Not to say that she should, not to say that, that's the, uh, that uh, the men can't do that, but that's the default, right? There are research, uh, research studies in uh, gerontology, the study of aging, shows that uh, women tend to live much more close to their parents than, than uh, men tend to live to their parents, right? So people, people uh, women tend to stay closer to their families than men do. It's not always the case. Lots of men are really close to their families. But let me just say, my wife, I lived with my mother-in-law longer for I, than I lived with my mother, with my wife. My parents live on the East Coast, 
and I see them once a year, and it's great. I love my parents. I talk to them a lot on the telephone. But my mother, my, my wife lived with her mother, okay? That's the way it goes. Not all the time. There's a lot of variability in the model, but that is sort of a default setting. Women are more likely to pursue dissolution in their relationships than men are. Women see problems in relationships before men see problems in relationships, usually. Women are more likely to be the ones to seek out any sort of marital counseling. Uh, women have a more elaborated understanding of the problems in their relationship when they seek out relationship counseling. Uh, women tend to be the bellwethers of relationships. Uh, when you do research on relationships, you're almost certain that the, the data that you collect from women tend to be reliable and they almost always tend to be more credible than the data that you get from men, even if they're married to one another. Uh, women tend to pursue dissolution. They see problems. Uh, they know when their relationship is struggling. So here's a Dilbert cartoon. Uh, and Dilbert says, uh, well, I got the latest numbers from Yvonne. Numbers. Numbers. Men like numbers, right? Men like systems and hierarchies and numbers. And uh, his coworker says, well, how's Yvonne doing with the sextuplets now that her house burned down and she had so shoulder surgery? Well, it actually didn't come up, right? That's, fun. That's funny, by the way. I, I think this is really, really funny. OK. This one, here's a, a guy heading out the front door. And he, uh, he, his wife is handing him his lunchbox. And she says, you forgot the launch codes as though you were the president of the United States of America. Right, and here are the launch codes for the ballistic missiles that we can use to attack the Soviet Union, right? So, that is, for a man, that is really unpleasant, right? That is really unpleasant because he is being insulted about his status, his, his role in the hierarchy, right? Men don't like to be nagged because it reminds them that there's somebody above them. I remember in uh, sixth grade, I was asked, what is the one thing you hate most? And I said, I don't like to be criticized. I did not, I still don't, most of us don't like to be criticized. But men have an aversion to criticism that is very, very powerful. Especially when it comes from a loved woman. Because it puts them down in the hierarchy, just like this, this woman is doing to this man right now. And if you don't believe that, just switch the roles. Just switch the roles. Now imagine that this is the man holding up a lunchbox to his wife saying, honey, you forgot the launch codes. It doesn't even make sense. It's not even, fun. it's not even as funny as this isn't funny. It's even less funny than this. But you see the point, right? He is now being slammed. And this, to him, is a huge insult, right? It's a huge insult. To a woman, it's like, what are you talking about? Right? You piss me off, I'll go talk to the next door neighbor. We'll talk about this. You know, I've got feelings. <laughs> He's not going to say that. He's just going to feel humiliated. He's orienting toward the hierarchy. OK, let me show you a segment from Knocked Up. And this, I hope, will be the final piece of my stellar argument, trying to convince you about this important fact about men and women. Okay, uh, Knocked Up is a story about uh, this guy named Seth Rogen who has a one night stand, as I wish I could have, <laughs> with Catherine Hagel, Catherine with a K. She's adorable. Uh, and Catherine Hagel, so, and she becomes pregnant as a result of that one night stand, okay? How many of you have seen this? Oh my God, <laughs> has anybody not seen this movie? Three people have not seen this movie. <laughs> I'm clearly in the wrong business, but I'm going to show you the one part that you need to see. So uh, his, uh, her sister, uh, whose name I don't remember, uh, and this guy, Paul Rudd, whose name I do remember, um, uh, uh, they are married. This is Catherine Hagel's sister. They have a, like a not so great relationship. And so they're trying to figure out what they're going to do during this pregnancy, right? And it comes to pass that uh, Catherine Hagel has received a telephone call from her sister, and she suspects that this man, Paul Rudd, 
uh, is uh, having an affair. Doesn't have really good evidence about this. And they are then going to go to, uh, to the address that they have where they believe this affair is taking place. OK? That's the setup. OK. So there he is playing fantasy baseball with his friends. What did he do the previous week? He saw a superhero crunch other superheroes, right? Men orient toward the hierarchy. Men orient toward the system. Women experience that sometimes as a violation. That's mean. This is worse than having an affair. I don't want you in the house. What? Because I, I'm, ha I'm playing fantasy baseball with my cap and my uniform, by the way, looking very cute, all of us dressing up. And you don't want me back in the house? No, because you have violated a trust. And that trust is you want to spend more time with your friends in the hierarchy than you want to spend in the family, in this horizontal relationship. I experience that as a violation. And I, I don't want to even see Spider-Man 3 next week with you. I want you to just know that's what I need, right? Those are different ways of experiencing the world. One orients toward where am I and please don't criticize me, right? He does not want to be criticized for this. I did this, I lied to you because I just don't want you to get mad at me. I don't like that. Women are fine with the anger. Men don't like anger so much, right? It puts them down. Women can work in that environment better than men can, right? But they want the closeness that comes from that. They want the closeness that comes from that. So this is a starting point for differences in intimate relationships. We all need to understand these differences. But we also need to understand that within these categories, A, that these are just default settings that we can all reset anytime we want. But we also need to understand that there are, there are individuals in the categories, right? And as I said earlier, there's a great variety, a great heterogeneity in ways to be masculine and ways to be feminine, and uh, ways to be a man and ways to be a woman, I should say. And that we think of masculinity and femininity as characteristics that both men and women can possess. Okay? In the old days, people used to think of uh, masculinity and femininity as being along one dimension. You were really masculine and you weren't so feminine, or you were sort of in the middle in a little bit of both, right? Or you were really feminine and not very masculine at all. That was the old conception. The new conception of masculinity and femininity is that men and women can be masculine and feminine, that they're relatively independent dimensions, and that any man has a range of masculine and feminine traits, and that any woman has a range of masculine and feminine traits, right? And when those two dimensions are high, uh, when someone has a lot of uh, especially stereotypically positive masculine traits and stereotypically positive feminine traits, that is to say nurturing and warm and sensitive and caring on the female side, and then on the male side assertive and uh, you know, uh, able to speak up for himself and uh, independent, able to do things on his own, when one individual, regardless of their gender, possesses both of those characteristics in a high degree, most of us like being in a relationship with that kind of person. Relationships, we have to remember, uh, require lots of different things to have to happen. And the individuals who have a lot of different capacities, which androgyny tends to tap, those individuals are the ones who are likely to be good relationship partners, right? It's not the only thing that matters in a relationship, but if you have a relationship with someone who can do lots of different things, who's not really a stereotypically narrowly defined female person or a narrowly defined male person, if they can uh, occupy lots of different roles and be efficacious in them, well, that person has a lot to offer. There's a lot of rewards to be had in being in a relationship with that individual. And you will remember that we talked in our last class about social exchange theory 
and what it is that we find rewarding in relationships? Well, one of the things that we find re rewarding in relationships is people who can do lots of things, people who can uh, be available to you in a nurturing role when that's what you need, or take charge in another situation if that's what the situation dictates. So people who possess high levels of both types of traits seem to fare better across a range of situations compared to people who are stereotypically masculine or feminine. And people who are high in expressiveness, lots of times that's the, uh, the way that people describe femininity is expressiveness. And people who are high in instrumentality, for example, are desired as partners. The combination appears to hold special appeal. OK. So here's a woman picking up uh, garbage, presumably uh, from her husband. And she is saying, sometimes it would be helpful if you were just a little bit more androgynous, right? OK. Let's, uh, by now, I hope you will have had the chance to look at the video that accompanies this, uh, this um, chapter in the book. And it is uh, really a, uh, a, a case history of a, a young man and uh, his coming out story and how he views his own uh, uh, homosexuality. It's really a, a, great, um, a great clip, I think. I hope you have the chance to look at that. And uh, Lisa Diamond, a well-known researcher from the University of Utah, is also featured in this clip and talks about uh, uh, sexuality. Um, let me just say a few things about um, uh, the um, contributions of uh, sexual orientation uh, to relationships. And um, now we're really switching gears, whereas in the first part of the class I was trying to outline how it is that men and women differ uh, in general and in relationships and then pointing out how there is variability within uh, men and within women along the dimensions of masculinity and femininity that help us to understand them and think about uh, how we might approach them in a relationship. Now we're switching gears and we're saying, OK, if that's one of the uh, essential and uh, 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 characteristics of relationships that absolutely can't be ignored, that is to say someone's biological sex, uh, another one is their, uh, their preference for uh, someone of the same sex as them or someone of the other sex, right? So now we're moving on to this issue, and we have to ask the question, well, does, is intimacy different for relationships in which uh, there are two men uh, or two women or as compared to a relationship where the partners are uh, uh, heterosexual and involved with one another? Uh, is that different? Do we need a fundamentally new way of thinking about human intimacy when we swap out the man and put in a woman or when we swap out the woman and put in a man? Do we need a fundamentally different way of thinking about human intimacy? And um, this is a, uh, a, um, a quiz that uh, was published many, many years ago, back in the 70s, uh, by a guy named Martin uh, uh, Racklin. And he wanted to draw attention to the fact that uh, people who are uh, gay and lesbian really are sexual minorities. And that, lots of times, is difficult for heterosexual people to understand. So he's, he was a therapist, and he worked with uh, lots of gay couples, uh, gay people more so than couples, I believe. And uh, he put together this questionnaire to, in some ways, uh, enlighten straight people about the kinds of questions that gay people get all the time. Things like this, what do you think caused your heterosexuality? Why are you heterosexual? Uh, when and how did you first decide you were a heterosexual? Right? One of the things that heterosexuals don't do is they really don't think that much about, gee, I'm discovering my own heterosexuality now. That's a new stage in my life. Usually it's just because you're part of the mainstream, because it's normative, you have the luxury of being in the sexual majority, and you really don't pause to think about it. But individuals who are gay or lesbian uh, often do, and that's not always an easy transition to make. Is it possi possible that your heterosexuality is just a phase you'll grow out of? Uh, if you've never slept with a person of the same sex, how can you be sure you wouldn't prefer that? Uh, to whom have you disclosed your heterosexual tendencies, and how did they react? With all the societal support for marriage, the divorce rate is spiraling. Why are there so few stable relationships among heterosexuals? And finally, how can you enjoy an emotionally fulfilling experience with a person of the other sex when there are such vast differences between you? How can a man know what pleases a woman sexually or vice versa? Good question, by the way, huh? Those are really good questions. But the idea is, and one of the first things that we need to start thinking about, when we try to answer this question, 
Now, I've asked you to consider a couple, and uh, we can consider stra uh, straight couples. We do that all the time. But if we consider a couple and they are uh, in a relationship where they are oriented to want to be with somebody or need to be with somebody of the sex that is, not the same, that is the same as their own, uh, the first thing we have to understand, or one of the first things we have to understand, is that the environment that they find themselves in is not as friendly as the environment that uh, heterosexual people find, them in, find themselves in, all else being equal. So a good working assumption when we think about um, comparing gay and straight relationships. In fact, there have been lots of studies. These, are, uh, these studies are really important to do, but they're kind of boring to read. And they go like this. We conducted a study uh, on uh, variable x, and pick any variable you want, on uh, um, communication styles, or uh, how much uh, time they spend together, or um, how much... Um, uh, how much time they spend going to church. We compared gay and straight couples on all of these variables, and you know what? They tend to not differ. We compared them on how committed they were to their partnership. Turns out they don't differ. We compared them on how much they had invested in their relationship. They don't differ. These are not terribly interesting studies. And time and again, we learn that the basic processes that exist within close uh, gay and lesbian relationships are very, very similar. And this is because we are human beings. When we enter into a relationship, we're human beings. And what matters, gay, straight, or otherwise, is that most of us want to be in a relationship where somebody understands us, where somebody does more than just understands us. They value what we have to offer. And not only do they value what we have to offer, but they care for us. They go out of the way and they do something to show that they care for us. And it doesn't really matter if you're gay or straight. That's pretty much how we're oriented. And study after study shows that that's a basic sort of dimension to intimacy, regardless of the uh, particular uh, um, person's uh, sexual orientation. But if, in the same way that we did want, not want to minimize differences between men and women, even though they're not huge, we also have to pay attention to them. We have to be flexible enough to say there are differences they're not huge, but we do need to focus on them. We need to study them. And the biggest difference, one of the biggest differences, I think, is the context in which uh, gay and straight people live their lives. So uh, in many places, certainly many places in the world, uh, it is not very safe or comfortable to be a gay person whatsoever. And there are even certainly places in the United States where that's true, right? So now imagine that this basic element to who you are as an individual, wanting to walk down, to st down the street holding your partner's hand or being seen in public with them uh, without even holding their hand but being affectionate toward them, that's no longer an, uh, an option to you, right? Those are different contexts. Those are different settings in which you are going to be uh, operating your life. Uh, gay people, gay and lesbian people have to come out, right? Straight people don't have to come out. You don't have to say to your partner, Mom, uh, you know, I, I think I'm straight. You know, how many of you have had that conversation? Not many of you, right? I, I'm, I'm struggling with this, but I'm straight. There, there it is. There's the truth. That, for a gay person, that is enormously difficult, is what I read. I'm, uh, I'm a straight person. I'm uh, heterosexual. But from what I read, the, gay exp the experience for a gay or lesbian individual, it's not easy coming to terms with that within their social group, within their family, uh, within all the community organizations that they're part of. That's difficult. That becomes an issue, and it's, uh, it's uh, a time of great vulnerability. It's a time when you're open to being rejected by other people, even people who care about you uh, otherwise very, very deeply. So the coming out process, we know that homo homophobia is... Uh, rampant, uh, not as rampant as it once was, but still it's an issue, uh, and um, that uh, gay and lesbian uh, people, people in gay and lesbian relationships, really don't get the same kind of support for their relationship uh, that straight people have, and that uh, that makes it difficult. If, uh, if you are a straight person and you happen to be married and you need some help from your family and your uh, uh, and uh, chances are they'll somehow figure out a way. They won't hold it against you that you're straight. But for some gay and lesbian couples, it will be held against you. And in fact, you don't even have the option yet in the state of California to uh, have your relationship recognized by the state. Right? So you cannot formalize your relationship 
And for many people who are, even for people who are heterosexual, you know that if you have moved from a, a stage of dating, from a stage of really a committed partnership uh, and possibly marriage, that your parents and your friends and your family members look at you differently than if you're just dating, right? Has, has anybody had that experience like, wow, now it's serious, and now my parents, they're sort of taking me for, for, uh, in a much more serious way, more than when I was just dating. Well, for lots of gay people, they don't have that option, right? They don't have the social institutions that allow them to say, you know, I've taken that step forward, and then their family can rally around that and uh, support them as they move ahead. Because you know from the social ecological perspective that relationships exist in a certain ecology. And if that ecology is toxic, well, it's very, very difficult for that to be kept out of the inside of your relationship. That becomes an issue that you have to deal with, as opposed to spending time doing other things that you'd rather do. So, uh, that's one big issue, is the context. And uh, sexuality and non-monogamy, this is one difference in relationships. It turns out, and now the data on this are a little bit old. There is not great data on this, and I have tried to find good data on this. But the data that I have seen suggests that the more men you have in a relationship, the more sex happens in that relationship. And the more sex happens outside of the relationship, right? So if you have a man and a woman, uh, there's a certain degree, there's a certain average amount of sexuality. If you take out the man and put in a woman and now you have a lesbian relationship, the amount of sexuality, at least by the, uh, even if we define that relatively broadly in terms of uh, physical intimacy, uh, that tends to be lower than it is within uh, uh, straight couples. And if you take out the woman and put in a man, so now that you have a, a, a gay couple, now you have a more sexual interaction. So there is a difference, and from what I've read, most men, partly because of the context, most men in gay relationships really have to come to terms and figure out a way to say, is this a relationship where we're going to be monogamous? Or is this a relationship where we're going to be allowed to have sexual relationships outside the couple itself, right? Most men, because the, the, the culture of, um, of uh, gay relationships, they have to figure out a way to solve that problem. And there is a, a big normative push, maybe less so than there was uh, in the era before AIDS, for there to be some openness in gay relationships. So that becomes an issue because we saw that earlier on, when we talked about gender differences between men and women, I pointed out the big one being an orientation toward more sex. This is something men want, right? And if you put two men in a relationship, well, that's going to increase the amount of sexuality that those two people want. If you take out the, uh, both men, and now you have two women, the level of sexual interaction is usually less, on average. I mean, these, these are all averages. Social scientists talk a lot about averages. There's a lot of variability around the averages, but those are the averages and we learn something from them. So um, uh, when you have more men in a relationship, two versus one versus zero, you usually have more sexuality within a relationship. And uh, unless I'm wrong, I do believe that most men, most men in gay relationships have to figure out a way to negotiate whether the degree to which they want their relationship to be open uh, or not, and how they're going to set some boundaries around that. Most people, most people when they um, uh, are in a, a heterosexual relationship, they assume it's monogamous without ever having the conversation uh, to establish that that is the case. I, uh, as you know, I collect data here on newlywed couples, and um, I uh, uh, got a questionnaire back from a couple. We asked them about the quality of their sexual lives, and we asked them this every six months. It's not a big part of the questions we ask, but I got a questionnaire back from one couple that said, you know, when you ask about sexuality, you're always asking about sexuality with one another. We have a totally open relationship. We have sex with lots of people, so the next time you want to know about our sexuality, you have to send us a bunch of questionnaires, each for the various partners that we have. That was the first time that has ever happened to me in a newlywed relationship, in, in the study of heterosexual newlywed relationships. Right? They said, we have an open relationship, and the exception proves the rule. Huh? I mean, this is amazing that, uh, that we, uh, within gay relationships, that becomes an issue. And in straight, in straight relationships, that's just not a concern. That's usually worked out. That doesn't mean that people don't have extramarital affairs, of course. Why do men have extramarital affairs? Usually for sex, right? Why do women have extramarital affairs? 
usually for intimacy, and their partners get upset at them for different reasons, right? So men get upset at women for having these uh, sexual relationships, when women get upset at men for having these close relationships. And so um, men and women approach uh, the extramarital issues differently, but gay and straight relationships differ quite uh, dramatically on this dimension, uh, with men being more oriented towards sexuality. Dissolution rates, we know, this is the third dimension that we've been able to discern much of a difference in gay and straight relationships. Uh, dissolution rates appear to be higher in gay than straight relationships in Sweden, and this may uh, be a reflection of the fact that they aren't getting as much uh, social support from their families, not getting as many resources uh, in uh, times of need. Um, but we also know that uh, lesbians have higher dissolution rates in this one study that's in the uh, reader than, uh, than do gay men. And that might be because when two people are really oriented toward intimacy, uh, that it requires a fairly high degree of sophistication and communication to be able to negotiate that degree of intimacy well. Right? So if these are pretty, uh, pretty intense relationships emotionally, in the sense that they do involve women who, on average, are going to be more emotionally oriented and more sensitive to lots of different aspects of their relationships, I think we can infer that, on average, those might be more intense. That might require more uh, uh, um, uh, higher quality communication to negotiate that and talk through that. So there are slightly higher uh, divorce rates, uh, dissolution rates, among lesbians and gay men. Um, the data on these, uh, at least on some of these newer findings, uh, the sexuality in uh, gay men, the uh, dissolution rates, we're still just, at, uh, just scratching the surface on being able to understand them. But at the very least, they do suggest that uh, there are sexual differences that we need to understand, and uh, they implicate the quality of the communication between uh, uh, gay men, and that there are emotional intensity issues that also implicate the communication of lesbian women. So, so what else can I say? Uh, here's uh, two gay men, and uh, uh, I assume they're gay men. Um, yeah, I think we're supposed to assume they're gay men. Uh, sometimes I think you only married me for the political statement. Right? That wouldn't be funny in a heterosexual relationship. What? It has to be gay men. OK, conclusion. Do we learn something about intimacy when we compare men and women, gays and straights? Undoubtedly, yes. But we cannot lose sight of the similarities when we think about the differences, nor can we lose sight of the individuals when we think about these categories. So when we consider a couple, gender and orientation matter, but probably not as much as the popular media leads us to believe. You know, remember that human beings have evolved to be pattern seekers. We love to find patterns, but uh, sometimes we find patterns where they don't necessarily exist. And it's only when we really sit down and think, you know, I know a lot of men and a lot of women, and they vary really dramatically in their personalities. I know some men who are really feminine, I know some women who are pretty masculine, and when you start to think about it that way, you start to realize that the popular media might portray us as uh, more polar opposites than is really war warranted. And so to fully understand intimacy, we have to consider and look beyond gender and orientation. And next week, we will talk about the individuals in relationships, but later this week, we will talk about uh, attraction and what it is that two individuals, regardless of their sexual orientation, uh, look for in a committed partnership. So thanks for your attention, and I will see you on Thursday.